All right, welcome to some new slides on number theory and encryption. I have so many things to teach you today. It'll be very fun. Uh, we won't get through all the slides, of course, but we'll make a good start. Here is a funny and relevant picture. It's an XKCD comic. Uh, feel free to laugh at it. And then when you're ready to move on, unpause the video and let's get started. So we know these terms already. Let's just review them. So we say that something divides something else. X divides Y. This is our syntax for that. If and only if X is not zero and there's an integer K such that Y is equal to K times X. So X divides Y. If you can take X, multiply it by some integer and make Y. Okay. So there's plenty of different ways to say that. There's many synonyms for that. So if X divides Y, then we say that Y is a multiple of X. Uh, and then also, if you want to think about it from X's perspective, X is a factor of Y, or a divisor is another word for that. So like X is a factor of Y, or a divisor of Y, or Y is a multiple of X. Depends on your perspective, but they're all equivalent ideas. Uh, and then here's a new idea, unless you've taken like a linear algebra class before, but this is called a linear combination. A linear combination is something you can make from two numbers when you multiply them by constants and then add them up. So a linear combination of two numbers is the sum of multiples of those numbers. So say you've got, I don't know, x and y. Those are your two numbers and you like to make a linear combination out of them. You pick two, uh, like, two multiples, two things to multiply them by. So pick like the two and the and negative 42, and then you multiply two by x and negative 42 by y, and then you add them up. And then the plus, of course, turns into a minus for this particular kind of linear combination. But that's that's all it means. That's, that's one kind of linear combination of x and y. Here's like another, you can choose like negative 43 on x and then plus 27 y. So it's just the sum of multiples of those numbers. That's all a linear combination is. But it's a useful idea. It will come up in a proof later, so we need it. Uh, so yeah, let's get started with uh, a proof about uh, dividing things. So if we know that something divides something, what can we what can we prove about it? What do we know? So all right, here's here's our uh, idea. Here's our theorem. If x, y, and z are integers, and x divides y and x divides z, so we got x dividing two things, we can prove something about x dividing bigger ideas. Okay, if x divides y and x divides z, it just so happens that x divides s, y plus t, z for any integers s and t. So ooh, hoo hoo, that's a linear combination, first of all. That's pretty nice. Uh, so if x divides y and x divides z, x divides any linear combination of those numbers uh, with integer coefficients. Ooh. Okay. So let's figure this out. Let's let's do this proof. And honestly, all you have to do is unravel the definitions. If you have these things, right? It's a direct proof. So assume these and then show this. So, all right. Let's assume that we've got x, y, and z arbitrary integers, and then we know that x divides y and x divides z. We like we have these at our fingertips. It's a direct proof, x divides y and x divides z. We're just gonna unravel the definitions of divides, right? What does it mean for x to divide y? Well, it means that y is equal to k times x for some integer k. So that gives me that I know that y is equal to k times x for some integer k. And then if x divides z, that means z is equal to some other integer. Uh, let's call it m times x. And so those are your two integers that are not necessarily the same. Okay, you gotta make fresh names for them. Can't, can't both be k or something. That would be wrong. For some ints uh, k and n. So that's what I know. And then what do I need to show? I need to show that x divides s, y plus t, z. All right, so need to show to complete this proof. I need to show that x divides s, y plus t, z uh, for some integers s and t. Uh, oh, sorry, for any integers s and t, excuse me, then it always works out, okay? So, okay, if we unravel the definition of that, what do we get? Dun, dun, dun. So if this is what it means for something to divide something, I in, instead of showing this, what could I show instead? I could show that, all right, s, y, plus t, z, for any s and t, it works out, okay? Equals uh, some some constant, uh, times x, some integer times x, let's call it r, r times x, okay? So if I showed this, then I will have shown that x divides s, y plus t, z for some, uh, for any, sorry, for any s and t. 
for any s and t. So kind of the, the proof idea is that if x divides y and x divides z, x divides any linear combination of those two numbers. So OK. Now this is what I need to show for any s and t. So this is like a for all, an inner for all. So we need to make arbitrary s's and t's. Let s and t be arbitrary ints. And I need to show that there is some r that makes this all work out still. OK? So all right, what do we know? We, know we want s, y plus t, z to equal r times x. But I know what y is, and I know what z is. They're these. Let's plug those in. So that's equal to s times the kx, because that's what y was. s times kx plus t times whatever z was, mx. And then, uh, OK, I can factor out an x from those, can't I? x times sk plus tm. And then this really looks like x times something. If you want to be very pedantic about it, you can put x on the right by the commutativity of multiplication. But honestly, we were pretty much there. What is this? What is this? This is an integer, is it not? If x, s and t are integers, and k and m are integers, and you're adding integers, and you're multiplying integers, you still have an integer. All right, so we found an integer for uh, that we can multiply x by and get s, y plus t, z. Isn't that beautiful? We just let this be our r. We needed to find one good r such that that worked out for any s and t. And that could be it. We found a way to make s, y plus t, z equal to an integer multiple of x. And so therefore, by the definition of divides, x divides s, y plus t, z. And because s and t were arbitrary, it works for any s and t that are integers. Isn't that glorious? So all right, if you, if you know some smaller facts about x dividing stuff, you know that it divides any linear combination of those numbers. Beautiful, OK? All right, with that, your turn. Try to unravel the definition like I was doing here. So is it true that 7 divides 21? Please explain your answer. Give me that proof using the definition of divides. So let me go back to the slide. So maybe pause here for a second. You're going to be using this definition. And then see if you can unravel it. So is it true that 7 divides 21? Assuming you gave it a try, the answer is yes, right? But why? The answer is totally yes, but why? Right? We'll use the definition of divides. So all right. If 7 divides 21, that means 21 is equal to some multiple times 7, right? Some integer multiple of 7, so like something times 7. And we know what that question mark is, right? We know that it's 3. It's equal to 3 times 7. And so that can fill in for your k. And we know that this is supposed to be an integer as well. That's the other requirement. And 3 is an int, obviously. That fulfills it. We know that we found an integer. And that times 7 is equal to 21. Cool. That means 7 divides 21 using the definition of divides. OK, so that's how you spell it out like that. Hopefully, that's making some sense. Uh, now, you try something a bit more similar to the first proof, similar to this one. OK, so take those definitions and unravel them. So for all integers a, b, and c, if we know that a divides b and a divides c, then a squared divides b times c. Try to prove that. Again, unravel the definition of divides. Maybe go back to this proof as uh, like to give you ideas, but give this a try. All right, assuming you gave it a good try, let me show you how I'll think about it. Well, we have a for all first, so we need arbitrary integers a, b, and c. So let a, b, and c be ints. And then it's a direct proof, right? If this, then that. So we're going to assume this, prove this. So let's assume that a divides b and a divides c. And assume a divides b and a divides c. So we got both of those at our fingertips. All right, and then, well, let's unravel these ideas. So if a divides b, what does that mean? So that means b is equal to some integer multiple of a. And same with c, right? c is equal to some other integer multiple of a potentially can't be the same let's do let's do k and j this time 
why not? For for some ints k and j. Uh, and then what do I need to show? I need to show that a squared divides b c. Another way to say that, what do I need to show? According to the definition of this, I need to show that b c is equal to some integer multiple of a squared. Let's call it r. Okay, so that's what I need to show right now. If I could show this, then by the definition of divides, I've completed the proof. So, all right, I need bc equal to something. So bc equal to this, and I can get there in a roundabout way again, because I know that b is equal to this and c is equal to that by these assumptions, okay? Let's see if I get an a squared out of that deal. So bc is equal to, well, b is equal to ka and c is equal to ja. And that is, of course, I can factor an a out of that. That's k, j, and then an a squared. I can take an a out of both sides, right? Just move them, move them over, right? Not even factoring. And what do you know? k times j is something times a squared. And isn't it an integer? Sure, because k and j are integers themselves. Multiplying integers gives you an integer still. So that can fill in for your r. And therefore, according to the definition, right? I've just proven that a squared divides bc, because I showed this, which is what I needed to show. Cool. All right, so we know a few facts now. You know that uh, some numbers divide other num one number divides other numbers. You know, you know that it divides in a linear combination. You know that you can kind of like multiply these in a sense, like this times this divides this times this, which is kind of cool to think about. Uh, or actually, maybe that's a bit more general. That I think you can prove as well. But that's some good practice. Uh, let's just talk about division now in general. What does it mean to divide some integers by another integer? Uh, so here's the division algorithm theorem. All right. So let n be an integer, okay, an integer you're trying to divide, and let d be a positive integer, the thing you're trying to divide that n by. All right. And so the theorem that uh, we won't show right now is that there are unique integers q and r, quotient and remainder, right? If you divide a number by another number, there's always only one quotient. There's always one remainder. And so this is what it's trying to say. There are unique integers q and r with r between 0 and the divisor minus 1, right? Because if it went, out, went in one more time with up to d, then like it would go in another time. q could be higher, but we don't want that. So this is what the remainder is, the range of the remainder, uh, such that n is equal to q times d plus r. So that original number that you're dividing is equal to q, the quotient times the thing you're dividing it by plus the remainder. All right, so just think about that. That's pretty much what it's trying to say. So it's like, if you have n, you're trying to divide it by, b, by d, sorry. That's equal to, that kind of looks like an h, sorry. You have an n, dividing it by d, that's equal to q remainder r. All right, that's what it's trying to say. And that q and r are unique cannot be changed. All right, so q is the quotient, and r is the remainder. And this is the range of what a remainder should be. OK? So this is very obvious, but it's actually not the hard, or not the easiest thing to prove. Uh, we'll get to it later, eventually, but not now. But uh, yeah, so q is the quotient. Oh my. q is the quotient, and r is the remainder. And if you want just those pieces, you don't have to like run the division algorithm uh, to say that. There's uh, some simple things. There's you got your div and your mod, right? So div produces it does integer division, and then mod does uh, remainder. So here is how you could use that in math. Just pretend you have these operations, and you can run them on it. So q is equal to n div d. We say so div does integer division, drops the remainder. So this is just mathematical integer division, essentially. All right, so for example, examples, 7 div 3, with well, 7 integer divided by 3, goes in twice with one left over, right? So 2. It's 2 point something. And then mod just gets you the remainder out. It's, it's the percent sign from C++. It's the modulus. So 7 mod 3, right? Because it goes in uh, twice with one left over, twice to make six with one left over, so that one is that remainder. All right. So according to the division algorithm, these are unique numbers, right? You can plug it in. That original number seven that we're dividing, seven is equal to who? What? Well, you're dividing it by uh, you're dividing it by three, so it's three over here, and then the quotient was two. 
and then the remainder was 1. So that's what it's trying to say. That's the division algorithm. These numbers are unique. So that is that. So here is here is n, here is q, here is d, and here is r. So that's what it means. If you're trying to divide 7 by 3, these numbers are forced. There's only there's two unique numbers such that r is within this range that work out. All right? So that's pretty obvious, right? We've, we've, we've had that in our minds our whole lives since we've learned about division, but uh, this is just us spelling it out, right? And this works out, right? It checks out. It is 7. It really is 7 because that's 6 times 1, right? And equals 7. Cool, and this is slide 7 too, so that's cute. Uh, so, all right, nice. So that's, a di that's the division algorithm, and so there are, there's an algorithmic way to compute these things, and it's just doing division, all right? So that mod, though, that's a very important thing for us computer scientists. We've used it a lot, I'm sure, by now. We've used that percent sign to generate random numbers, for example, among other things. So let's let's talk about math using mod, okay? Because that's that's something you can do. Because uh, a lot of the time it is useful, and in, in computer science it is. Uh, this happens a lot. Maybe you haven't just you haven't run into it too much yet, but it, you will get there. Uh, it's very useful to have numbers that wrap around, like a clock, right? Ever, after 12 comes 1 again. Yeah. So clocks wrap around. Clocks are doing what's called modular arithmetic. All right, so here's the idea. If you pick a number, number m, let's say, and you always do mod m, you take the remainder by m, div after dividing by m, after every calculation you do, and you're working with integers, you get what's called modular arithmetic. Okay? So it's just like every time you do an operation and, and like you get some answer, then you're always going to do mod m. Let's say mod like m is 5, right? So you can do like, you're going to do mod 5 after whatever answer you get, right? Mod 5, mod 5. And so, uh, like remember that it wraps things around. So like 0 mod 5, it goes in 0 times uh, with 0 left over, 1 mod 5. You're trying to divide 1 by 5 and get the remainder. 1 over 5, there is no quotient, and the remainder is 1. There's 1 left over, right? All the way to 4 mod 5 equals 4, and then 5 mod 5 is where it wraps around, right? It goes in once with 0 left over. 6 mod 5 is equal to 1. Well, these are supposed to be 5s, hopefully that's that's visible. Uh, let me just rewrite those better. My prettiest 5s, just for you. There. Okay, so yeah, you see how as you as you work, if you always do mod five by whatever number, even if it's large, the range that it comes down between is always going to be zero through four, right? Your only options for your numbers, if you always do mod five, for example, is zero through four. In general, mod m, it's always zero through m minus one. Okay, so you just always do mod m after your operations like that. Then you're forced to have values within this range, assuming you're doing integer things. We're talking about integers only right now. And so, for example, you can do integer. Uh, addition mod m, addition mod m we say, so you do x plus y first, and then you can take the modulus. Multiplication, if you're working mod m, we say, all right, so do, do the multiplication and then do the modulus, okay? So, like, here are some examples of that. Let's say that we're working mod 5, all right, we've, we've picked 5 for our m, we're doing modular arithmetic mod 5, so, like, every time, if, every time we add, like, 4 plus 3, you gotta do mod 5 at the end of that. Right, so we get 7, that's 7 mod 5, and so how many times does that go in once with 2 left over? So the answer, the final answer is 2. The only answers can ever be, if you're working mod 5, the only answers you can ever get are 0 through 4. All right. Same with multiplication. First you do the multiplication, then you can do the mod m. So let's do 4 times 4 mod 5 again. We're pretending that we're working mod 5, so that's 16, that's too big. It's not between 0 and 4. We'll do mod 5 to bring it down, and so that is 1, all right? So the answer of 4 times 4, if you're working mod 5, the answer is 1. It's weird to think about, but the idea is you're, you're just always working uh, mod something, and you're doing that at the end of every calculation, all right? So that's modular arithmetic, and this is a whole field of study, all right? Uh, here's there's some fancy terms. So when if you want to use mod m addition and multiplication, you sometimes say that, like, I am working right now in ZM, all right, if you're doing mod M. So if I'm working mod 5, I'll say I'm working in Z5, okay? 
because z is the integers, and we say that kind of like we're we're going to shrink them down. So zm is just the numbers 0 through just the integers all the way to m minus 1. All right, so that, that's what that means. I'm working with only these numbers, zm. OK? So for example, mod 5 addition and multiplication looks like this. It's kind of weird to think about uh, 4 plus 4, or sorry, 4 times 4. That's 16 with 1 left over. So this is, this is multiplication. You multiply 3 times 2. Uh, and you get one in Z, in Z5 in mod five land, all right? If you're working in Z5, uh, let's see. Some of them make sense still until you get past things like I don't know, three times two is one. That's the same thing. Two times two is still four, but three times three is apparently four, right? Because it's nine. You do mod five, and then there's four left over. It's weird to think about. So that's multiplication for Z5. Uh, addition in Z5 makes a bit more sense. Like you see, like. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 0 again, right? Because it gets too big. Because 2 plus 3, that's finally 5. And that, you do mod 5 after the end of that, then that's 0 left over, OK? So that's pretty cool. Uh, so that's Z5. That's another way of saying I'm working uh, mod 5. And uh, another way of saying this, a synonym for all this, is saying that uh, if you get an answer, you say, and you're working mod something, mod m, let's say, you say that your answer is congruent to some other answer, mod m, OK? If after taking that mod m, you come up with the final result being the same, even if x is not the same as y, right? If you just do the mod first, then they end up being equivalent, right? Because the idea is, like, these two numbers, they used to be different. They used to be different. Let's say that here's like a good example of this. Zero is, uh, you write it like this, by the way. Zero is equivalent to five when you're working mod m. Or sorry, when you're working mod five. Does this make sense? So x and y, zero mod five is equivalent to five mod five. Because, OK, five is too big to be within the range. You're going to do mod five at the end of all of your cal calculations you end up with they're both going to be 0 after you do mod 5, right? They are equal. So we say that they are congruent. 0 is congruent to 5 mod 5, or vice versa. 5 is congruent to 0 mod 5. OK, that's how we say it, and this is how we write it. Like they're equivalent under mod whatever. So some other examples, mod 5, like 5 is equivalent to 10. It's 5 is congruent to 10 mod 5 if you're working in Z5. OK, they're the same, because if you do mod 5 on both of these, you get 0. Same with like 15 is congruent to 55 mod 5. Still all zeros. And like 1 and, and 6 and 11 are all congruent to each other mod 5. You see that? So you're kind of like, you're giving up some numbers. You're wrapping around a clock now. You're working in modular arithmetic land. But uh, this leads to some cool ideas, all right? Technically, every number in computer science, like your biggest uh, Biggest int is like 2 to the 32 minus 1, and then then it starts wrapping around, OK? So overflow is essentially modular arithmetic on ints. Now you know. So OK, so there's that. Let's prove some stuff about this, OK? So uh, theorem. You can do, if you're working in mod whatever land, the order in which you do the mod doesn't actually matter a whole lot, OK? You can you can do mod m on each number before you do the plus or the times. That'll make it easier for you to do the work by hand. And you still get the same result. So watch this. What I'm trying to say, this theorem is trying to say this. If you want to do, if you're working mod 5 still, let's pretend, you're working in z5, and you want to do like 77 times 63. So those are way huge numbers, right? And you want to see the answer mod 5. Well. The theorem is trying to say, you don't have to multiply this, get a giant number, and then take the remainder. Instead, you could do this. You could do 77 mod 5 first, shrink it down to be between 0 and 4, and then shrink 63 down mod 5, make it smaller, and then take that final answer and do mod 5. So this this will be between 0 and 4. This will be between 0 and 4. And then it's easier to multiply them and actually understand the answer. OK? so like. These are easy, right? What's 77 mod 5? It's, well, it goes into 75 with 2 left over, so it's 2. What's 63 mod 5? It goes, goes into some amount of times to make 60 with 3 left over. So it's 2 times 3, then mod 5. Whee! Uh, let me make that smaller and legible. 
mallhud5. That still doesn't look great to me. Let me let me squish the three over here. Two times three, and then I'll do mod five. There. Well, that's six mod five, which is one. So that answer is one. And so that's so much better than having to do that long multiplication of, what do we got? 77 times 63 first, like computing 4851 and then doing mod five. Oops, sorry, mod five. And yeah, the answer is still one. All right, so the theorem is that always works. You can always do the mod first, make the number small uh, before you do your operations, and that, that makes it easier on you, okay? So let's prove just the addition case of that. The, the multiplication case is just as, uh, just as simple, uh, same idea. And so I proved that you could do the other one if I do the addition one for you. Uh, and so let's write it out. Let's write out what we're trying to prove here. Let's prove the addition case. I just showed you kind of the multiplication case, but it doesn't really matter. So here is my theorem. Let's say that x plus y mod m is equal to first do x mod m and then do y mod m and add them up. Add up those answers and then take one last mod m. So you're shrinking them down before you do the work. And that saves you time, right? This is also true for multiplication. And you could prove that one too. It'll be just as easy. Uh, so we're going to prove this case, but first we need some lemmas. So here are the little helper ideas that we need. So uh, if you use the division algorithm, because what is what is x mod m but uh, like it's your remainder, right? If you go back up to the division algorithm and you have your number, you're dividing by something. If we're working mod m, essentially d is our m here. Uh, n is equal to q times d plus r, and what is r but n mod d. So if you take those ideas and you kind of like shove them around and into like one big equation, like you replace r with x mod something and you change like, you change d to m, uh, so like this is d, you get a quotient back and you get your r back, right? And you're taking x as your original number, not n anymore. So we're trying to do, we're, we're working x mod m, right? So if you unravel the definition and like you say that x is your original number, you're trying to work mod m, you can, you can come up with this equation, okay? I believe that that makes sense, right? So it all works out. You can come up with this equation. Uh, so that's our first idea, that's pretty cool. Uh, what does that mean? Well, now you can solve, right? You can solve for x mod m. x mod m, what is that? Use, according to the division algorithm. It's equal to, well, your original x minus i times m, right? And then I would like to prove this final theorem kind of bigger lemma. x mod m is equal to x plus km for some integer k. I've just shown that x mod m is equal to this idea, but uh, I don't have plus km, I have minus im. But honestly, watch this. Let k, this, this is honestly going to let this proof go through on, on the previous slide. Let k be equal to negative i. There. That can be my k. Okay, then, sure, then I found a k such that then x mod m, oops, there's supposed to be an o in there, is equal to x plus km. All right? Simple as that. Uh, and this is what I want to show. All right? I want to, I was trying to prove this idea. x mod m is equal to x plus km for some integer k. And this is kind of a cool idea, right? We haven't really thought about this much. It's, it's working with numbers. So it's kind of this idea. It's like if you have, like, you have 1, right? 1, one mod 5, of course, right? 1 mod 5 is equal to 1 no matter what. Just forget that I put some space here right now. 1 mod 5, of course, is equal to 1. But what this theorem is trying to say, or this lemma is trying to say, is you can do whatever you want to this one as long as you add integer multiples of the thing you're modulusing by. One plus five, for example. You can kind of like cancel out any multiple of the five if you're doing mod five. It's still one. Six, six mod five is still one. You can do one plus, I don't know, let me make this bigger. You can do 1 plus uh, 77 times 5. No matter whatever amount you put here, it's all going to go to 0 if you do mod 5, right? Because all these multiples, they go away. You like They wrap around the clock. And you've really only gone one, one revolution, essentially. That goes to 0, and the, the final answer is 1. 
And so this is what it's trying to say. We're, we're losing some information by, by writing this out, but this is really going to help us for our theorem, right? Because this looks a lot like, you know, the x divides y kind of thing. Like there's some k such that this equation works out. So that's pretty nice. We're going to go from modulus to, to math, full on math. And that's going to help this previous proof go through. But isn't that pretty cool? Like you can take your number, like 11 mod 5. It's always according to the definition of all this stuff. Of course, the answer is 1, right? The answer is 1. But according to like all this stuff, all this definition, it's equal to your original 11, right? Your original 11 minus the quotient, because it goes in twice, right, to make 10, minus 2 times the, your modulus, the thing you're dividing by. So times 5. I guess I'll put the 5 right there. So that's always true, all right? We're just rearranging stuff. There's always, there's always a way to use the division algorithm to create the remainder, to solve for the remainder. And that's that, all right? So x mod m is always equal to x plus km for some integer k, OK? That's the idea, because all this goes to 0 under modulus land. That's, that's what I'm trying to say here. All right, so with that in mind, using that lemma, let's prove this. So all right, x, mo x plus y mod, sorry, mod m is equal to first do the mod m on the on the smaller numbers, then you can finally do the mod m on the on the final answer to make everything nice and small. So what do we know? All right, because I'm working with x mod m and y mod m. If I'm working with these numbers. What do I know? So what do I get from this this lemma? Right. If I know that I have an answer, like I'm working with x mod m, what's another way of writing that? x mod m is equal to sum is x plus some multiple of that modulus thing. x plus km for some integer k. Okay, and same with y. If I'm ever doing y mod m, another way of writing that, another way of claiming that I have that answer, that's equal to y plus some other integer, j let's say, times m. So this is all true for some ints, k and j, cool. Uh, and then, all right, let's let's do this. Let's do this side first, right? X x mod m plus y mod m, because I know what those are. I can break them down. So I've got all right x mod m plus y mod m. Well, and then I'm finally doing mod m after all that. Still, sure. That's equal to x plus km. All right, break it down, x plus km. Let's write that a little prettier. Km plus, right, with y mod m now is equal to y plus jm. So plus y plus jm mod m. OK, so that's pretty nice. Uh, and then now, that's equal to well, I can bring the x and the y's together, right? I've got uh, x plus y, and then uh, the, these things, the k and jm, can be over here. And I can also factor out an m from these. I can take these and factor out an m. So that's m times k plus j. Isn't that cute? Uh, and then I'm doing mod m. So for the same reason over here, the same idea that this was trying to say, uh, do you see how this m goes away? It goes away to 0, and that's why this is true. right? It goes away to 0. Isn't that beautiful? This goes to 0. All this goes to 0. Any time you're multiplying an integer times m, and you're, then you're doing mod m at the end, uh, that works out, right? assuming you're doing mod m. So that's. That's the idea. I guess I should not put this here because I didn't say mod m right here. But that is what it's equivalent to. You can cross things off like that. Okay. So with that in mind, this all goes to 0. Isn't that beautiful? So that's equal to, finally, just x plus y mod m, which is what I wanted to show. Isn't that lovely? So you can do that work first, the hard work of making these, or the easier work of making these smaller first. Then you can do your operation. So I've proved that it works for addition, but you can also prove that it works for multiplication. So that's modular arithmetic uh, in a nutshell, and a cool little proof about it. Uh, here's something for you to try now. So compute the following uh, values, like do 33 mod 7 and do negative 33 mod 7, and show your answer.
all right? Because what C++ gives you back is actually wrong here. C++ is not going to do the right thing if you plug this in and print it out, okay? It's very unfortunate. So give these a try and maybe use the definition of mod and the, like the the idea for the division algorithm. There's that, this one. All right, remember what R has to be within? All that fun stuff. So we've talked about it here as well. Uh, okay, give these a try. All right, so what is this answer? 33, 1, 7, 7, 7, 14, 21, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. This is five, right? The answer is five, but how? How do you know that? Well, it's because this is the remainder and you're dividing by seven and you can use the division algorithm. 33 is equal to, right, according to the division algorithm, there's unique quotient and unique remainder. It's equal to quotient times D plus R, where R is within this range. So let's, let's unpack that. 33 is equal to, well, it's, we're dividing by seven, it's four times seven, right? Plus how much is left over, it's five. And so these are unique answers, four is the, the quotient five is the remainder, uh, as long as the remainder is within the correct range, which is between zero and six, right? We have to show that, yeah, five is between zero and not seven, right? All the way to six only. So this equation plus the division algorithm shows us that yes, okay, five was the answer. Therefore, 33 mod seven is equal to five, okay? And then this one is ugly. This is this is unfortunate because if you plug this into C++, it will not give you the right answer. Some programming languages take the easy way out. I, I think Python does it right. They don't follow the division algorithm. They don't follow the requirement that uh, the the remainder is between pot zero and like six if you're doing mod seven. Less than or equal to R, which is strictly smaller than D. So R must be between zero and D minus one. Okay. So essentially what we need to do is use this equation, negative uh, 33, use the division algorithm is equal to something, something times seven plus the remainder, and that remainder better be within this range, okay? And so if you think about it long enough, there is only one value. It's gotta, you gotta make it too small. You gotta make it even smaller. Seven goes, uh, you can go in negative five times, right? To make negative 35. And then you can add two to get uh, your negative 33. Does that make sense? And then this two is finally within the correct range. It's positive or zero, not negative. So therefore, the answer is two, okay? Negative 33 mod seven is equal to two, okay? So that's how you know and that's how you prove it. That's how you show that you got it, which is kind of unfortunate and disgusting because C++ will not, I think C++ will give you a negative remainder here, which is kind of unfortunate, okay? But according to math, the remainder must be non-negative. Okay, that's what real remainders mean. Okay, so now you know. Now you can prove uh, that things are a certain, uh, you get a certain answer for a quotient or for a remainder. And now you try using this theorem, all right, to save your life. All right, make it easier on yourself. Simplify this as much as you can. Calculate 44 to the 12th power mod six, all right? Don't do the 44 to the 12th power first, because that's a giant number, and then you have to do this mod six somehow. That would take you all day long. See if you can simplify it. All right, same with this one, five to the sixth mod seven. Don't do five to the sixth power, because that's a giant number, and then you have to divide it by seven. See if you can break it down using these ideas. Can you find a trick? All right, make it easier on yourself. All right, um, dun dun dun. Well, what is a number, right? What is this, 44 mod six, uh, 44 to the 12th mod six? Well, it's just a bunch of multiplications and I can do, I can shrink down the 44 mod six before I do my bunch of multiplications. So that's, this, that's the first trick. So let's do this. 
Let's do 44 because I was just multiplying, right? And that theorem applies. 44 mod 6 first and then take that answer to the 12th power. And then I can do mod 6 at the very end, okay? So what's 44 mod 6? It's apparently uh, 36, 42, so it's 2, I think. Uh, let's confirm. Yeah, it's 2. And then I take that to the 12th power. And then I do mod 6. So this is still very large, all right? So I can break this down further. Uh, there's a, a cute trick. I stole this from the book. I wouldn't have thought of this myself. But to the 12th power, what's that? But, well, it's to the 6th times to the 6th mod 6. And now you have multiplication again. And so you can break this one down and this one down mod 6, and those are easier, OK? So that's equal to, what's to the 6, 2, 4, 6, 8, no, sorry, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. 64 times 64 mod 6. And then according to our theorem, I can break this down mod 6 and this down mod 6 and then multiply them. So 64 mod 6, that's not too hard. That's just 4, right? Because it goes into 60 with 4 left over. So now that's 4 times 4 mod 6. Yeah, I'm breaking it down using uh, my little theorem here. You can do the mod first before you do uh, multiplication or addition. Beautiful, beautiful. So that's just 16, right? 16 mod 6. And then that's not too hard, right? So it's 12 with 4 left over. So the answer is 4. And you can do this on paper, right? So that's not too hard. You didn't have to think about it. You have to do a giant answer, 44 mod 12. You have to do this, right? Because, I mean, it is mod 6. So the, the answer is 4. But that would take you all day, right? Same with this one. Let's try this one. Did you, did you notice the trick there? What's this? It's kind of this idea. Break it down into smaller things that you can multiply. This is 5. Uh, 5 cubed twice, or 5 squared three times. So this is 5 to the 6th is equal to 5 squared cubed, right? Still mod 7. So that's 25 three times, right? 25 times 25 times 25 mod 7. And I can just shrink these down mod 7 first. That's beautiful. So all right, what's 25 mod 7? 7, 14, 21 with 4 left over. So it's 4 times 4 times 4 mod 7. So that's cute. We get 64 showing up again. 64 mod 7. And so 7 goes in like a few times to make 63, right? And then so there's one left over. 64 mod 7. That is just 1. And so you didn't have to compute this giant answer, 5 to the 6th power. But it really does do the same thing. It still is 1. Okay. So that's pretty nice. Now you know uh, you can make it easier on yourself. So that's that answer. That's that answer. Lovely. OK, so that is modular arithmetic. There's a lot you could think about there. And really, computer science, we're in computer science, we are doing modular arithmetic when we work with integers. It's just a very large modulus. So you can think about it that way. Uh, but it's also just useful to understand. So OK, with that, let's move on and talk about not modular arithmetic for a second before we're done today. Let's talk about prime numbers, all right? So uh, a number is prime, we say. If it is an integer, it's got to be greater than 1. So the first prime number is potentially 2, and it is 2, right? Uh, and its only factors are 1 and the number itself, all right? So we, we've heard of this before. Uh, if it's not prime, it's called composite, all right? It's composite if it has a factor other than 1 or itself. OK. Uh, and then you can compute things about numbers as well. So the greatest common divisor of two numbers, x and y, is the largest positive integer that's a factor of both of them. And one way to find the greatest common divisor is to compute prime factorization. OK, so like if you want to find the greatest common divisor of 12 and 18, you've got to find the biggest positive number that goes into both of them. The standard way is to write out their prime factorization. So 12 is equal to, it goes in 2 with 6 left over, 2 times 2 times 3. So that's that's 12. And then 18 is prime factorization. There's also a 2 in it. And then there's a 9. So that's 3 times 3. And then you just kind of circle, highlight the ones that they have in common. So 12 and 18, they have a 2 and a 3 in common. So 6, that's the biggest number you can divide cleanly into both of them. So the greatest common divisor, or GCD, uh, of 12 and 18 is 6. OK, is the GCD of 12 and 18. And then likewise, you have the least common multiple as well. 
uh, the least common multiple of two integers that are non-zero is the smallest positive integer that is an integer multiple of both. All right, so it's going to be the next. It's going to be a bigger thing. That's a, that's the first multiple of either of those. So all right, for example, let's find the least common multiple. So question mark is the least common multiple of uh, let's say six and eight. Let's find the least common multiple of six and eight. All right. So what you do is you take 6 and you take 8 and you start making multiples of them and you find the smallest one that they have in common. So you got like 6, 12, 18, 24, and then you got 8, 16, 24, and th that's the first one, right? 24 is the first multiple of each of those that they have in common. So the answer is 24 is the least common multiple of 6 and 8. 24, okay. So that's some numbers, some, some words about numbers. This is number theory, of course. Uh, and then another another word that you probably never heard of before. I think maybe you've heard of each of these other ones. But two numbers we say they're called relatively prime if their greatest common divisor is one. So they don't have to actually be prime numbers. It's just relative to each other. They have nothing in common. They have only one in common. So they're like prime to the to each other. So that just means that they share no factors. They're relatively prime. Okay. So they don't have to be prime themselves. Let me just put that in a different color. That's important. Don't have to be prime themselves. OK, uh, so that's what we say. Two numbers are relatively prime if their greatest common divisor is 1. For example, 7 and 12 are relatively prime. But they're not prime numbers. Well, 7 is a prime number. 12 is not a prime number, though. But they share no factors, right? That's the idea. So they're, they're, they're relatively prime if their greatest common divisor is 1. OK, I hope that makes sense. 7 and 14, though, are not relatively prime, because 14 is it's 2 times 7. And so there's a 7 in there. OK, so that is some ideas about prime numbers and so this is a really exciting proof. I'm excited to, to show it to you. It's a classic one. I'm going to prove for you right now that there are an infinite number of prime numbers. OK, it's really nice, really cool uh, theorem. And we're going to prove it by contradiction. All right, we're going to prove it by contradiction. Uh, let me give myself some more space, actually. Uh, that's better. Uh, the way that this proof is going to go through by contradiction is we're going to create a number like this. All right, this is the intuition. So kind of understand this. If I have a bunch of numbers and I multiply them together, and then I add one, don't even worry that these numbers are prime right now. It doesn't even matter that they're prime. So if you take a bunch of numbers and you add one after multiplying them, is the resulting answer, this answer, is it divisible by any of these? Two, three, five, or seven, those original numbers that you multiplied? Like, try to divide the number by 2. Like, it goes in 3 times 5 times 7 times, but there's 1 left over. See that? It's always going to be, like, divide by 3. There's always going to be a remainder 1. You see that? So that's the trick that we're going to use in this proof. Divide by 5. It's going to be remainder 1. See that? So let's use that in our proof here. We're going uh, to we're gonna do it by contradiction, right? So it's, the theorem is that there's an infinite number of prime numbers, so we're going to assume that there aren't an infinite number of prime numbers. And we're going to, like, the universe is going to, uh, break from that, okay? And uh, we're also going to use the fact that every number is a multiple of uh, prime factors. Okay, so again, is this number div divisible by any of those? No. So, all right, here's our proof. So assume the theorem is false. Assume there aren't an infinite number of primes. Assume there's a finite number of primes. There are a finite number of primes. And all right, what does it mean if there's a finite number of primes? It means you can list them all out, right? You can make a big long list, p1, of all the primes in the world. There's, there's the first prime, there's the second prime, there's the third prime, like this is two, th uh, three, five. You got them all, and you can list them down. And because it's finite, that list, even if it's large, it eventually stops. So there is a last prime number, if we're assuming there's a, a finite number. There. Here's the biggest prime, there it is. That's the last prime. OK, uh, and now let me make a special number. Uh, consider a number called k. Let me write this word better. 
consider this number, k is equal to p1 times p2 times all the p's multiplied together, p1 all the way to pn, multiply every single prime together, and then add 1. See what I'm doing here? So consider what this number is, right? k, it's a number. It's supposed to be, right? Every number is supposed to be a either prime or multiple of prime factors. Okay, so uh, it's it must be, right? It must be, because it's a larger number, we know it's a larger number, it must have been a bunch of the primes on this list multiplied together. Yeah? It must be. That's what it means for a, a number, right? It must be a bunch of primes, or even just one, multiplied together a bunch of times, right? Because it's a big number. It's bigger than all these. It must be a bunch of primes from the list multiplied together. Because every number is a multiple of primes, and these are all the primes. From the list, multiply it together. But it doesn't work out, right? If you try to divide, like, do you see, see if P1's a factor of this number, see if P2's a factor of num this number, there's always going to be one left over. You see that? None of these, but none of the P's, none of P1, P2, all the way to PK, or sorry, PN. None of those prime numbers divide K. Huh, that's not right. Every number should be a multiple of prime factors, and like this, these are all the prime factors ever in the world. We've assumed that there's that, only those. We've found a problem, all right? Let's spell it out. So, we've got a problem. K, K this number, it's not a multiple of any of these guys. That's a huge issue, all right? So, either, right, either K itself, right? Either K itself is prime, right? What, what must be true about K right now? So either it's prime itself, which is a contradiction because like it wasn't on the list because every, every number is either prime or composite. So either K was prime and like we just discovered it and it should have been on the list or there's a smaller prime. K was made up of a bunch of primes and the first prime that it was made up of was bigger than PN. Okay, or there's a smaller prime, smaller than K itself. There's a prime we forgot to list. You see that? So in either case, in either of these cases, like they contradict the fact that we wrote out all of the primes ever. Right? K should have been on the list if it was prime. Or if that's not the case, if there was another prime that, that made it up, that one still wasn't on the list. Okay? Because we couldn't factorize it. So in either case, we've, we've derived a contradiction, which means our proof is over. It means that our original assumption that there are a finite number of primes must have been wrong. So therefore, there are an infinite number of primes. And that is a classic cool theorem that you always learn in, a, in, your, in your first class on proofs. So I am, I'm glad to be the one to, to show it to you. And so that is where I want to end today. We'll come back and do more cool number theory stuff next time.